Good evening. Well, it's good evening for me, I have to say. This is why you've got this horrible lighting. You can see it's very, very shadowy because I'm using two floodlights on this, this video. I apologize for that. I normally record in natural light, but it is the evening. I, can't, I do not have natural light. Anyway, today's video, I've got some PIC microcontrollers in front of me. We're not really discussing microcontrollers, but as a means to an end. So, something that I, you see in YouTube now more and more is prototype PCB services being advertised and saying that, yeah, look, you can get 10 boards for $2 or 5 boards for $2 or whatever it is. That's really good value for money. You should all go and get your boards made abroad and then import them. And while I understand that does seem like good money, the problem is, is what if you're doing a project that you only want the one board? Many of the projects I do at home, I don't want 10 boards, I want one good board. So what happens to the other 10? Or the other nine, sorry. Do you just throw them out? How do you recycle them? And this is the problem. Although we're saying it's cheaper to buy a board, we're creating a huge amount of waste in the process. So today I want to show you some uh, PCB techniques I use to make home boards and I use some fairly small components which actually are not that small in reality. You can use at home very easily. You don't have to make boards abroad to make use of these components. So let me start off by showing the uh, the component I want to use. We've got some PIC chips here. Up here we've got the PIC 16F1829. Great, great size of breadboard. This is always, I always breadboard using these dip packages. It's great. It really is. It's the answer. However, when it comes to making the PCB, not so great because I have to then route tracks either top or bottom and you don't really have much you can do left or right. It, it, it complicates. If you want to go for a single board, it makes it a single sided board, I should say. It makes it very difficult. And most of the boards I want to make at home are single sided. Not because I can't make double sided boards, but because the board itself is cheaper if you just get single sided copper clad board than if you get double sided clad copper clad board. Try saying that 10 times faster. So I want to, I want to make this smaller and I want to have it so I can route traces, route traces in any direction from it. And the answer for that is, of course, to use the quad flat pack uh, footprint, which are these. You see, there's uh, four of those in there. Uh, if I just get a bit closer, let's just adapt our focus in a little bit. Do, 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 do. There we go. And if you look on my thumb, there's my thumb. There's the size of the package. It is pretty small. And also, if you look at the size of the packages, you cannot see the pads either side of the package. So the hand solder this is going to be a little bit tricky but we'll look at some techniques of how you can achieve that at home very easily. So you can you can use this on your own homemade boards without having to worry about getting them manufactured professionally. So let's have a look at some screenshots and I'll go through the process. So if we have a quick look at a simple board design here using the quad flat pack, we can see we can actually run traces from all around the board, all the sides, so we don't have to go top and out the bottom like we uh, we would have to do if we're looking at the uh, dip package. We can also decide, well, most of these are just ordinary GPIO outputs, so we could actually adapt our design. So we could change our, our outputs or our inputs to what uh, pin we want to use to make it better to design on the board. So rather than just say in our design profile, right, pin for example, up here five is going to be our switch. And when we get to our layout, we suddenly realize, well, hang on a minute, our switch is going to be down here somewhere. Then, you know, I've got to cross all the way over the board somewhere, run a trace all the way around the board to get to the switch. And that means I've got to cut through all my other traces leading off. And if you had a two layer board, you might think, oh, I'll just drop a veer then go to the, I'll use the underneath of the board but again still doing that if you had to draw a veer out of here or a via depending on how you want to pronounce it and go all the way down the board you've cut along the whole length of your board to get the switch at the bottom of the PCB so either you have to move your switch or if the switch has to stay where it is because that is a design 
factor of the final PCB and the product has to have the switch there, that's non-negotiable. Then what's more logical is to say, well, a switch is a switch, it's just an IO. So rather than use pin five up here, I am going to use pin 14 down here. So now I don't have to cross over the board at all because it's now closer to where the switch has to be for the product, which is just ideal. And this is what's good about having four sides you can work from because no matter where I place stuff, I can move my circuitry to accommodate where what side I want to tap off on the quad flat pack. So rather, if you imagine it almost like a city centre, so this could be London, for example, and then these are all the suburbs coming off of London, and I can adapt my board just like that. I can span it out. I can let it spider out and just naturally let things flow. And if you know, and you'll just find as you start laying the board out, it just all comes together. Keep everything grouped together to the function of the circuit, and you'll find it will just flow. And you'll find this little green uh, via down here is because, unfortunately, I was trying to use an ADC port, and stupidly, I thought pin 9 over here was an ADC port, and it wasn't. I actually meant to connect it to pin 20 over here. So this is the problem I'm actually talking about. Look, I had to run a trace across the bottom of the board that cut the whole board up. Or if I did it on the top side, I've cut across all my traces. I've had to go across all these traces to get to that port there. So, you know, it makes much more logic to use a quad flat pack and then span out from the use that as the middle and span out and you'll be surprised how easy you can make a single layer design. Also, you'll notice the way that as I fan out each of my traces, I keep maximum gap as they come out. So rather than just go straight out, there's like a little dog leg in there. And normally you wouldn't worry about that. You'd think, oh, well, you know, most board houses can cope with that that proximity but when you're designing your own board at home don't make your life any more difficult than you have to so if you need space make space like this all these traces up here you could run that as one big bus you could just put them all together and run them next to each other but instead i've used um, a large spacing just so when it gets to the point i have to bug check this i i you know my my probes aren't going to attach attach to one of the others by accident or or, or short something out it just makes life much easier so how can we go about soldering this chip on our breadboard? Because I've already discussed at the beginning of the video that there's no side pads. You can't put an iron against it and hope you can reflow solder. The only answer is to, of course, use solder paste. So here, I haven't got a template. You can plainly see that. I have way too much solder paste. The uh, solder paste dispenser I was using, the little uh, syringe, the needle on it is far too fat for doing this work, but I had nothing else. And I can show you how you can make this work. There's, no, there's not a problem here. So we can see that uh, we have far too much solder paste, it's, but it, we've gone all over the pads. So we've covered the pads. Now, you should really also solder what they call the flag, which is that center bit, which is the pad underneath the chipset. Normally to do that, you would uh, drill some vias in as well to connect it to the ground plane on your board i don't have a ground plane but if you did you would connect it to the ground plane and that's uh, useful for thermal properties so obviously the chipset would work better if it actually effectively had a heat sink and you're using the ground plane as a heat sink which is in the application notes if you look online uh, for microchip somewhere you will discover the application notes for using the flag of a chipset and they'll go into all the things you should do another good reason to have the veers is that the solder paste has somewhere to go if it's in excess if the solder paste couldn't go down the holes, then you create a mountain of solder paste and then the quad flat pack would sit on top of this mountain of solder paste and it wouldn't connect to any of these pads here because obviously it doesn't reach those pads there. It's, it's actually, it's, it's on its own little hill effectively of solder. So by having those, those holes there, the solder can flow in if there's too much and it will keep the chips sitting on the board properly. I have chosen here not to solder the flag, the, the the design, this is the, the circuit board I was designing. I don't need the thermal properties of the chipset. It's not great. You should always solder that pad if you're going to use it, if it's in the application notes. Interestingly, however, when I looked at the 1829 data sheet, I couldn't see anything specifically mentioning that you needed to solder that pad. So I didn't drill the holes because I don't, I don't have a ground plane and I didn't uh, bother soldering it, which is bad, I do admit. And another reason for having that pad there is it stops shearing force. So if you were to shear across this with the chipset, 
it can actually just rip everything off because there's not a great deal holding this chipset on it's only little pads so that's why you need something a bit more substantial which they are, that's the whole idea of the flag anyway put the solder paste on and you can see there i've just pushed it into solder paste and then reflow it with hot air and uh, this is actually the second stage you can see where the solders actually flow down the tracks actually what would happen is if you just resold it reflowed that you'd end up with some sort of blobs at the side of the pads where you've got continuity issues so what you can do because i'm using low temperature solder paste rather than get your old solder wick out and wick around the chip you could just hold your iron close to the chip and that would be enough heat to travel down the track it would melt the solder and then the track itself would be a wick so that the, the excess solder would flow back down the track which is what's happened here i've i've, I've gone round and i've reflowed the solder to get over the fact there was way too much solder paste on there to reflow it and you can see uh, on the actual device there is loads of space between these tracks so there's no danger of us shorting anything out if you had solder mask on it obviously that would help it from bridging but if you did have solder mask, obviously you couldn't access the tracks to warm back up against uh, with the iron to reflow it. And the solder wouldn't flow down the track. So you'd have to actually literally wick it off around the chip. But having the the, uh, the bare traces there, you can just wick it by, by literally heating up the trace, letting the solder flow back downwards. And the excess, flow, the excess will flow back, but you'll find there'll still be a good connection between the chipset and the board. So here we go. This is... A really simple way of designing with uh, a quad flat pack it gives you the ability to do it on one side of the board you can make your board at home you don't have to go out and get it professionally manufactured you know this is a one-off board I don't want more than one so why would I go to the expense and the cost of the environment to go and get this board manufactured professionally so that covers what I wanted to do in this video is a quick look at how you can add to your own boards components which may not be that friendly to hand soldering using solder paste and hot air the danger of using the hot air like i'm using rather than go through a proper reflow temperature range uh, you can actually end up heating off the flux and you can end up blowing solder balls all over your pcb that happens uh, it's it, you have to deal with it and the way to deal with that is to get ipa and a stiff PCB cleaning brush and the PCB cleaning brush obviously is non-static so it shouldn't cause any problems and you literally scrub your board and make sure you scrub across your board so you get rid of the solder the solder balls rather than actually just throw them into another into another IC or something that would be silly so clean your board nicely afterwards and you too can really easily simply solder a QFN package onto a board it's not difficult I hope you have success doing it I had great success. You can see my error there. Can you see where I've cut that trace off? Uh, and I had to recorrect it. But that's the part of when you design a board by accident, you make accidents. You know, you know, you, you make oversights. And you can see here, I've had to adapt it afterwards. Fortunately, when I design boards, and this is a good tip, is that even if you're not using a pad, break it off into a header. So I've got a pad here I wasn't using, but I've still put it to a header. And these pads over here I wasn't using, but I put to a header. So that means afterwards, when I put a mod wire in, I actually effectively drilled it up here, ran the mod wiring into this pad, and then ran it up into the back of this header. So I didn't have any problems really trying to modify this board. And again, if you had a professional board and you put a ground plane on the back of this, it's, it's, you'd have to scrape off the solder mask, cut around the ground plane so you had a nice clean bit of board you could drill through, otherwise you'd risk accidentally uh, shorting your ground plane out, etc. So sometimes making your own board is a damn sight easier than getting it made professionally because you can make little adaptions to it and uh, you can also increase your track whips and that your parting so you know you've got loads of room on the board there's no point continuing making something as small as possible if is that's if you don't need to do that don't don't make yourself hard your life hard for yourself actually i think a lot of people do by accident because they think oh we should we should uh, push the the limits of manufacture because we can and it's uh, do you really have to no don't do it if you don't have to is the answer and I've made home PCBs for donkey's years and the amount I've learned from making a board myself and then moving that into professional manufacturer and making a professional board is staggering. You learn so much more making your own boards. So I hope that's helpful. If you want to know more about the process of making your own boards, I'll be more than happy to show you. I photo etch my boards, so I actually use uh, a UV resistant uh, chemical on top of the copper clad 
then I expose it to UV light of my design, then I uh, photo resist it into the developer, then I etch it rather than use toner transfer. I do not like toner transfer. Toner transfer is a rubbish way of making a PCB. Photo etching really is the better way of making a PCB and it's the way they use professionally. And uh, so yeah, definitely you can do that at home. It's not difficult. I hope this video has been helpful. Take care.